Do you sense, though, that there is uh, something missing here in his response? Did you notice that his orientation was towards the things of the world, wasn't it? And actually away from the, the values of God. Yet he thinks that he's as religious as the next guy. What could he possibly mean by religious? Does it mean that he can keep up appearances with God by going to church and, you know, all will be well? In spite of his desires for those things, contrary to the will of God, does being religious mean that he can still believe he's on the inside when, in fact, he is actually on the outside? I want to suggest to you that this man is in like manner akin to the man in Romans chapter 7, as we looked at that a few weeks ago. You see, he is like the man who, say, seeks to keep the law but finds sin to be a too formidable opponent for him to succeed. Yet these people can rely on being religious. They may not be keeping the law or even seeking to keep the law, but they do have something very much in common with those who do try and keep the law without Christ, and that is the absence of the Spirit. There is an abrupt change that has occurred between Romans chapter 7 and what we're looking at today, chapter 8. Because chapter 8 is absolutely awash with spirit, imagery and language. I've mentioned previously that there were 18 occurrences of spirit, capital S for Holy Spirit in chapter 8. I actually shortchanged you on that. I did another count. There's in fact 19 occurrences of the Holy Spirit mentioned in chapter 8. And of course this is in stark contrast with chapter 7 and the man who through sin and the flesh failed to keep the law. So what do we mean by that? The man in chapter 7 is the man designated as being in the flesh, in the flesh. Let's have a look here at chapter 7 and verse 5 to 6, because here we have a neat two-verse summary that encompasses the thoughts of chapter 7 and also chapter 8, Romans chapter 8. Look what it says here in verse 5. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. Now that gives you the summary of chapter 8 in a nutshell. Uh, chapter 7. Thank you, Ted. At least he was listening, wasn't he? But now in verse 6, he says... But now, notice that great word there, now. Actually, when we start in chapter 8, it says, therefore, there is now no condemnation. So we've got the before and after. So here in verse 6, it says, but now, reflecting chapter 8, we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the Spirit and not in oldness of the letter, that is the letter of the law. Now, this is a very important designation because the man in chapter 8 is called the man in the spirit. So what we have is one is void of the spirit, that's in chapter 7, and the one who is possessed by the Spirit of God, which is chapter 8. Now, this is very crucial to our, our understanding. We need to understand the differences here. So in Romans chapter 8, verse 8 to 9, this is what Paul writes. He says, And those who are in the flesh, the man in chapter 7, cannot please God. And he says, However, you are not in the flesh, if you're a Christian, however, but are in the spirit. That's what he says. So you can be as religious as the next guy, 
But if you do not belong to Christ and possess the spirit of God, Paul writes, you can never please God. It's that serious. Now, these two chapters, chapter 7 and chapter 8, also represent two ages, two eons. We could say two time periods even. One represents this present evil age, chapter 7. The man in the flesh, that has no power to please God. The other, chapter 8, represents what is commonly known in the Gospels as the age to come. So the bottom line is this present evil age that was interrupted with the resurrection of Christ. The age to come therefore began with the resurrection of Christ. He has been raised. The future has begun. You see, this is important to understand. The spirit has been given. On the day of Pentecost, the apostle Peter, in his sermon to the, the great throng of people there, speaks about the coming of Christ, rather the coming of the Spirit. He quoted from the book of Joel, as there were 120 there in the upper room who received the Spirit of God and they were all talking in different languages on the day of Pentecost and there was, they were befuddled by what was going on. And so Peter gets up and he preaches a sermon and he explains that this is what's happened. He explains from the book of Joel. So he says in Acts chapter 2, verse 17, he quotes there, And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. And then down in verse 32, he's still talking. He says, This Jesus God raised up, and of all, and of, I'll start again. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. So 120 on the day of Pentecost, proclaiming the gospel of God in the languages of the diaspora Jews. Now that is the Jews who had been dispersed throughout the known world. You know, these are the Jews of the likes of those who were deported by the Assyrians, if you can remember that. And they were spread throughout the empire. They never returned. But Jewish communities flourished all over the known world. And these Jews made a pilgrimage from all over the known world back to the land of Israel, to Jerusalem, to be there for the feast of Passover and Pentecost. So now these people who know all these other languages from around the world are there in Jerusalem and they're befuddled because as they hear the gospel proclaimed by these 120 Galileans, they're trying to work out in their mind, how do these Galileans know our language? Crazy. The apostle Peter gets up and says that this, what you're witnessing, is that which was spoken by Joel. That which you now see and hear is the fulfilment of prophecy. The last days have begun. The age to come has now begun because God has raised this Jesus whom you crucified. This is why the Spirit of God has now been poured out upon God's people. Because Christ has been raised. The end of the age has begun. And Christ is pouring out the presence of God upon the people of God. So after explaining in chapter 7 the dilemma of the person who you know, faces a difficult time in keeping the law of God while he's still in sin and flesh and, and finds that these powers are just too great for him to handle. The mind might be focused on the law of God but he's a man of flesh. He, has no, he hasn't got the spirit of God to enable him. And so at the end of chapter 7, Paul, in desperation, cries out as, as a man in the flesh, as projecting himself to be a man in the flesh. He cries out there in verse 24, wretched man that I am. Can you see the dilemma that the man in the flesh faces? Wretched man that I am. 
Who will set me free from the body of this death? Who will set me free? So re realize this, that the apostle is speaking from the position of the person who belongs to the present evil age, who has not yet come to know Christ Jesus as Lord and Saviour. He's speaking of the man who seeks to align himself with God, but he's devoid of the Spirit of God. He has no power in his life to be able to live for God. There would be, dare say, a fair amount of people who fit into this category. You know, they don't want to be too embroiled, too committed to Christ. They just want to stay at a safe distance. You know, maybe tinker around the edges. There's a fair chance that these people have never surrendered to Christ. And the reason being is that they want him on their terms. Clear teaching from his word is then ignored, either by the lack of motivation for it or by fear of having to face the reality of what that teaching actually means in their life. So they stay at a safe distance. However, we've got to realise this is not the motivation of the person in the spirit. Examine this for yourselves. Think about it. What other activities does the person in the flesh involve themselves in? I mean, how capable are they, are, are they at attending events that they really like to be at? Say the football or, or the like. Yet, you know, church attendance or involvement in the Christian community is just kind of not an option. They can't get out of bed for that, but they can get out of bed for sport or other things. Work this out for yourselves. Let us not be deceived. The spirit is what makes living for God possible. That's what we need to understand from chapter 8. God's spirit makes keeping the intent of his law possible. For those in the flesh, however, it is not possible. It is not possible. This is what is very clearly spoken of here in this passage of scripture. So the apostle Paul begins, therefore, with a direct answer to the plea, who will set me free from the body of this death? And there he says it in verse 2 of chapter 8. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. How wonderful, and you know, how practical, how practical. You know, so often we see this only as sort of some status conferred upon the Christian. You know, we're in there with God, we're right, we can rest on our laurels now. Rather than seeing it mean as an aid, as a help, to live out our salvation. Look at verse 3 to 4 of chapter 8. Let me summarise some things he says there. For what the law could not do, God did in sending his son, so that, notice purpose, that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk according to the Spirit. God gives his son, Jesus, as an offering for sin, forgiveness full and free. Yay! Fantastic. We all say amen to that. There is now no condemnation, he writes, for those who are in Christ Jesus. We're forgiven of our sins, but this salvation does not stop here. Notice, his son lives forever and ever to save us from the power of sin. So, this little statement up here on your screen is something we need to understand well. The Christian is released from the penalty of sin, but also released from the power of sin in the practical sense of everyday living. We go back to Romans 5 verse 10 and the apostle writes there, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. You see that there? He keeps us in a right relationship with God. And this is undoubtedly achieved through his spirit that lives in us. His spirit 
is God's empowering presence in the life of the Christian. Much more having been reconciled, we are going to be saved by the life of Jesus who lives in us. There are people who say that they are as just as religious as the next guy, yet their minds are constantly turning to other things, fleshly things, rather than the things of God. What we need to understand is that the terms flesh and spirit are powers, real powers, that are kind of outside our bodies, outside ourselves. We struggle, yes, we do have that struggle that takes place within us. You know, the decisions we make and what we do, whether we're going to please God or please ourselves in maybe some sinful things, and we, we wrestle in ourselves, what are we going to do? Are we going to be selfish? Or are we going to go God's way? You know, maybe love our wives the way we ought to love our wives rather than just be selfish in our marriage. You know, there's lots of those things that we consider. And we, we, we tend to feel this tension within ourselves. But there are two real powers outside ourselves. We are merely the battlefield, the battlefield of the choices that we make regarding these two powers. Which one are we going to lean on? Which one are we going to use in our life? In the last chapter, chapter 7, Paul describes there the inability of the man in the flesh to be able to please God. We call him the unregenerate man, the one who hasn't been renewed by the Spirit of God, the one who is not a new creation in Christ. He is unregenerate. That's the word we give to this man. He is unable to live out the intention of God's law. He has no help, no power. He is inept. He is powerless against the force of flesh. He gives into this power all the time and can't do anything about it. Have a look at what Paul says in verse 14 of Romans chapter 7. He says this, For we know that the law is spiritual. It's good. But I am of flesh, sold into bondage to sin. Now, this is not the Christian Paul speaking. He has here thrust himself forward as another man, the man of the flesh, to show the workings here of the sinful nature when the natural man tries to keep the law. He speaks here as being in bondage to sin, a slave to sin. That's what it's talking about, which really is totally contrary to the Christian position where in chapter 6, Paul says that through Christ, we have been freed from sin. We have been set free from that bondage. See what he writes here in chapter 6, verse 4. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. Then in verse 6, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Note the slavery imagery here. So the term then, man of the flesh, is really metaphorical for the natural man, the man without the spirit of God. Now this man may well have his mind set on wanting to please God, you know, on the law of God, but in his natural self he has no power to live for God. All that ends up happening is this other power, flesh, takes over and he can't help but sin. The law of God is amazing, but it comes with no help. It comes with no aid. We read speed signs on the road all the time, but often we don't heed them, do we? The sign itself, let me tell you, it renders no help in obeying the speed limit, does it? Does it help you take your foot off the accelerator? No, it doesn't. But you see, a change of heart makes things different. You know, when God converts the heart and he gives his spirit to us, then our direction is entirely different. For example, you may have children and, uh, you know, very sensitive to the dangers of speeding, especially near 
school zones. What drives you then to regulate your speed is not the numbers written up there on a sign, but a change of heart about what that sign really represents for other people, you see? Likewise, the Spirit of God transforms our heart. And when the believer sets his or her mind on the things of the Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit orients us towards God and towards his will in such a way that we pursue him and we find life and peace. What a difference the Spirit of God makes in our life. Such statements in the word here are clear. The mind set on the flesh, he, Paul writes, is hostile to God. It does not subject itself, he says, to the law of God. And he writes, it is not even able to do so. Again, he says, those in the flesh cannot please God. And the mind set on the flesh, he says, is death. So, you know, when you hear people making platitudes to God and Christ, and, but the mindset you find is oriented away, you know, towards fleshly things, then you should take note. Don't be deceived. Now, I've seen all sorts of people make grandiose statements about the Lord, you know, from rock stars to politicians to Hollywood personalities. How much of the spirit and the work of the spirit do they understand? What fruit of the Spirit is resonating in their life? Notice in verse 9, he says that anyone, anyone, he writes, who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. And what remains is death. Now, of course, he's talking twofold here. There's two, well, there's twofold ways we can understand death. Death, of course, is the natural consequence of the sin of Adam and Eve and also result of our own sin. But we have a penalty to endure, and that is physical death. But there's another way to understand death as well. It's eternal death, eternal destruction. There where God banishes the person from his presence, and that really is hell. We need to understand that all order in the universe, all wholeness is actually a result of God's wonderful grace and his creative and life-giving excellence. We just live in the good and assume it's the norm. You know, if you are away from the light, you're in the darkness. If you're away from health, you're in sickness. If you are away from wholeness, you're in brokenness. There is no party in hell. That is the talk of foolish people. So in verse 9 to 10, he says, If Christ is in you, and if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. There he writes the challenge. The challenge for the reader to see that it is true. How do you know you have the Spirit? Is he a feeling, an emotion, or the force, as in Star Wars? What assurance, that's the key word I'm wanting to bring to you today. What assurance does the Word of God give that a person has his Spirit? Now, perhaps I'm treading where angels fear to go. But the answer to this question is going to derive from whether you wish to lean on scripture, experience, or even perhaps tradition. I remember years ago, I was challenged over whether I had the spirit by people who claimed to speak in tongues. The only assurance that I had the spirit, I was told, was that I spoke in tongues. Now, certainly in the book of Acts, some people after receiving the spirit spoke in other languages but tongue speaking was not assurance for those people who were speaking in tongues it was not the assurance of the spirit for them it was a sign for the jews you see the doubters that god could ever grant his spirit to the likes of samaritans and gentiles for them, they would say, you have got to be kidding me. 
You see, speaking in tongues or languages was an indicator for the Jews that these people had not only received the Spirit, but had been accepted by God. That was what it indicated. The Spirit indicated their acceptance by God. If you go to the scripture, you will find that these manifestations were carried out to bring unity to the church. God does not want a separate Jewish, Samaritan and Gentile church to operate. That is not to be tolerated. The body of Christ is not to be divided. And God did some special and unique things to convince the Jew that he has opened up his grace to these different people groups, Samaritans and Gentiles. Today, assurance is what many people are looking for in respect to the Spirit. There are two places you will find this assurance given from the Word of God. One I will deal with in the next passage of Scripture, but today the other one is found again in the sermon of the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost, where he talks there about the promise of the Spirit. There in Acts 2, verse 38 to 39. To those who were stricken in heart, in conscience, about knowing that they were part and parcel of the crucifixion of the Messiah and wanting to know what they could do to have their guilt removed, Peter gives them this instruction. He tells them to repent. He tells each of them to be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then he writes, for the promise is for you and your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. So here we find there is a vertical and a horizontal dimension to this promise of the Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. So vertically, he talks about to the generations below, you and your children. Horizontally, he talks about to the nations all across the globe. Neither repentance nor baptism stand on their own. Obviously, repentance is tied to faith in the person of Jesus Christ. And repentance means an about face, about turn in life's direction. Perhaps at one time seeing Jesus as a, as a phony Messiah or even like a, a cuss word to use around the workplace or at the sporting club. But now to confess him as Lord and Christ. Before Jesus, in front of his disciples, ascended to heaven, he told them to go into all the world to make disciples of the nations by firstly baptizing them, that signals conversion, and then secondly by teaching them all that he has commanded. That is, that is the ongoing growth process in the life of the disciple, maturing process. Paul has also spoken of this in Romans chapter 6. They're of the new believer following their Lord in his death as materially revealed in their baptism. Baptism into death. And now Paul knows that baptism happens at the beginning of the life of faith because he sees the baptism as a person dying with Christ, not sometime down the track. You don't die with Christ sometime, you know, years and years after you, you come to know him. He sees them as dying to Christ as they come to know Christ and then entering the age to come. Now, if you're looking for assurance, the gift of the Spirit is associated here with repentance, faith and baptism into Christ. Now, notice I said if you're looking for assurance, I'm not making a judgment on anyone who has or has not the Spirit. That's not my responsibility not even my prerogative. My responsibility is to be faithful to the text of Scripture. Experience for me is secondary. Scripture should always take precedence and be our guide. So if you're looking for assurance, you need to walk in the Word of God. So in contrast to the mind set on the flesh is the mind set on the spirit. And what does it result in? Paul says, in life and peace. 
You know, death is our great enemy, isn't it? We fear it. We loathe it. But Christ has conquered death. He has put an end to its sting. The mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Where are you this morning? Do you know Christ? Where is your mind set? So it works this way. If we have died with him, we will be raised with him. When a person comes to Christ, they give up, surrender is a good word, the control of their life to God. That is what it means to die. You give up the control of your life. You know, it also means to give up ourselves to God as his possession. No longer possessing your own life, controlling it the way you want, but to relinquish that control to God and then to become his possession. I'm afraid you just cannot be as religious as the next guy with this. You can't have it. But having to die to sin and to the flesh, it says we are raised to a powerful resurrection life in the spirit. Now that life is now. That life is now. And yet it is also to come in bodily resurrection. So spiritually, Christ has raised us and renewed us now. As you possess his spirit, you are renewed. You're made a new creation in Christ. You've been made new spiritually. Physically, we're going to die, of course. Physical death is the penalty of sin that must still be carried out. Yet, as the spirit raised Jesus Christ bodily from the grave, the believers also look forward to that day when the spirit will also raise them bodily from the grave. When a person joins him herself or herself with Christ, they become in union with Christ. And if they die with him, they will also be raised with him. So in summary, in what we've looked at in this first section of chapter 8, we have discovered that you just cannot be as religious as the next guy. It won't cut it. Living or tinkering around the edges is just fruitless, absolutely fruitless. Only through coming to Christ as Lord and Saviour, receiving his spirit, can help you live out the intention of God's beautiful law. It's the only way you can please God. Only through his spirit can we know life and peace with God. The spirit is only accessible through Christ. No other name, no other religion, no other ideology. The spirit is only accessible through Christ. To be in Christ is to surrender possession of your life to him. To live in Christ is to surrender the control of your life to him. If you die with him, you will live with him both spiritually and in the future in bodily resurrection. I think it is clear for the Christian, we are the only ones who have true hope in this world. 